Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. You know what's really interesting is, is, is I'm hearing you talk is 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 that you know there are words that our culture likes to lift up and make central. Um, I mean, I'm thinking here, obviously, liberty is an important word, and freedom and choices and that kind of thing. But there, there, there's danger in those concepts if if they become strictly self-focused. Mm-hmm. Um, and a good theology of work connects you to the creation. It connects you to the creator. It connects you to your responsibility to other people. It's your your description of steward is what made me think about this. And in that connection with other people, and in that connection with the ideals of, of service and contributing, um, you set the framework for allowing work um, to speak positively into your life, whether it is making that widget that allows that brake to work so that not only are cars safer, but lives can be saved. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, maybe it's it, it's another innovation that, that allows um, – uh, something as simple as a camera to work in a car, so that when you back it up, you don't run into the car behind you and 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 do damage. You know, it, there there are all these little things that come with with work. Even uh, even a, a waiter or or someone who's doing a service in the service industry. You know, the way they deliver the food and the way they interact with the customers. To make that a pleasant experience, I was at a presentation recently by an executive of Chick Fil A, in which they talk about how they go out of their way to make sure that people just don't come to have a meal, but that the, but there's an expression of appreciation for the fact that they've come to mm-hmm. get chicken yeah. at Chick Fil A, yeah. Um, yeah, for which all the cows are grateful. Yeah, and so- <laughs> absolutely. And you know, I think you've you've really put your finger on something important by drawing the connection to freedom, because I think. Um, we can forget that a moral character a, and a cultural, so individual moral character and also a culture, a public character, if I mm-hmm. may put it that way, oriented towards serving others rather than serving ourselves mm-hmm. is absolutely essential to any freedom worthy of the name. Mm-hmm. And is, in fact, the precondition for keeping any freedom worthy of the name, Mm -hmm. that people who are oriented towards serving themselves and satisfying themselves will not stay free for long, Mm -hmm. because they will be at the mercy of those who can control the conditions for satisfying their desires. Mm -hmm. If you believe that the way to have a good and happy life is to satisfy your own desires, to gratify your own uh, uh, wishes, Mm -hmm. uh, you will be at the mercy of those who can make that possible for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you will lose your freedom very quickly. If you have an orientation towards serving others, uh, not only will you be liberated mm-hmm. from control by mm-hmm. others, uh, but also in the long run, that creates the only possible cultural conditions in which people can be given personal liberties, mm-hmm. uh, and in, including all the personal liberties like freedom of religion. Mm-hmm. You know, we evangelicals are absolutely militant about freedom of religion, and mm-hmm. I think we need to see the interconnectedness of a culture of service to others mm-hmm. with all of our freedoms, including freedom of religion. Uh, that we are going to lose, we're going to lose uh, uh, the cultural basis of freedom if we don't have a culture that helps people see the way to have a good uh, and happy life is to serve other people. Now, obviously, we can't disconnect that from God and the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. Um, We don't want it to become a mere legalistic message, but integrated with reminding people where this comes from, reminding people who they're ultimately serving, which Mm -hmm. is God, uh, to, to orient human activity towards serving each other rather than satisfying ourselves. Um, is the essential precondition uh, of freedom, but also freedom is not worth having unless it is freedom for that kind of culture. Now, let, let's turn our attention a little bit to, to pastors and what you do with them. Yeah. Obviously, we've set the groundwork for why uh, holistic discipleship should be talked about. Let's talk a little bit about uh, about what you see in the churches, and I'm kind of going to do the, hopefully, a, a before and after. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, before we think about this, and, and we think about what we generally see in the church, and we've already alluded to this a little bit, we see this not 
not being talked about very much or addressed directly and people being left to fend for themselves from Monday to Friday, uh, that kind of thing. Um, what kinds of things does the Kern Family Foundation do to speak into that void? And then what do you hope to see on the other end of it? Uh, mm-hmm. if, we, if I were to paint a picture of what holistic discipleship would look like um, after having uh, thought about this, uh, what would you expect pastors to be doing on the other end? Uh, okay, so the before and after picture. Right, right. I think uh, what we're concerned about in the before picture is that uh, by and large, uh, uh, many churches will speak about uh, church activities as if that is the only way to serve God, mm-hmm. um, and will uh, the moral message becomes very abstract and high level. You know, be a good person, except when it comes to giving to the church and showing up at your Bible study and so doing be your a busy bee in the right. pew. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But then outside that context, the call to to live the kind of lives that honor God becomes very abstract and intangible. Um, and the the implicit message there uh, is that uh, church stuff matters more and is the real path to God, mm-hmm. whereas the other stuff is something we put up with it because we have to. Um, on the other, in the in the after picture, we want pastors to talk about what people do all day and all week long mm-hmm. um, as something that is service to God, service to neighbor, and uh, the place where the life that honors God is lived. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not to the exclusion of, of uh, church activities. But you know, the, the people that I've spoken to who have been sp- spending decades sort of pounding the table for this message, Mm -hmm. Uh, they often report that the big anxiety pastors have is, uh, if we do this, how will we get people into the Wednesday night Bible study? Uh And how will we get people to give money to the church? You know, we're barely making ends meet or, Uh you know, what. uh, But their experience has been that when churches actually change their thinking and um, describe all of life and all the callings that are present in their congregations as service to God, they find that actually engagement with church activities and giving and all that stuff goes up, not down, Mm -hmm. because people begin to see the church as something that equips them Mm -hmm. for Christian life 24-7. And when the church steps into that role of equipping people for life 24-7, rather than getting people into the box, as Mm -hmm. one of my pastor friends puts it, Mm -hmm. we got to get people inside the box, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, the church comes across as self-serving, and yeah. that is the emphasis. Right, and people are not, you know, people are not motivated to give and get involved in that in that circumstance. Some specific examples, and I wish you know if we could, if I could give you hours of of examples, <laughs> but a few specific examples. Um, mention the workplace in your prayers during the service, because you know, again, not to the exclusion of other things, but if you've got a congregational prayer in your service, why are we not praying for people's working lives mm-hmm. in that part of the service? Mm. Uh, bring that before God, uh, and, and, and let's pray about it and pray that our work will be something that honors and pleases God and serves our neighbor. Um, Another example, uh, and, and these get, these are just examples, and some of these, you know, different churches have different ecclesiologies, and mm-hmm. they might not, this might not fit your, you know, your mileage may vary. This might not right. fit your ecclesiology. <laughs> but many churches are, uh, uh, when they get interested in this, will adopt the practice of commissioning the laity to their work, mm-hmm. uh, the way we commission missionaries to their work. Oh, that's an work. interesting idea. Uh, so I've talked to several pastors who have tried this, mm-hmm. um, and, and uh, they they have really found it spiritually powerful. So one example, uh, David Gill at Gordon-Conwell Seminary talks about how uh, in in churches he works with, uh, they will once a month have a lay commissioning uh, moment in the service, Hmm. and each month during the year they choose a different type of profession. So one month it'll be healthcare workers, and another month it'll be uh, commercial uh, retail workers, Mm -hmm. and another month it'll be 
uh, sort of safety services like police and fire and that kind of thing. And through the year, they map it out. And you know, education. Right. Through the year, they map it out. So they've they've pretty much covered you know all the bases, and nobody feels left out because everybody's got one month of the year. And what they do is they just ask everyone who works in that field to stand up, and the the pastor just says, "We this congregation commission you to go do your work in this field uh, to honor God and serve your neighbor, and talk a little about how that field serves people." People oh, and that's glorifies a great God. Idea. I just think you know. Yeah. I'm, I've talked to people who say, "Well, that doesn't fit with our ecclesiology," and I want to respect ecclesiological, you know, differences. But it just it strikes me as a very a very good thing. <laughs> it's a variation of something that we do in the church that I'm at, uh, which is a traditional Bible church. And and once once a month, we have the elders come up and just receive people for prayer, and we take ten minutes out of the service. For people to come up and they share their requests, we pray with them while the congregation is singing and supporting them in prayer. And then once, once, once so that's the first Sunday of every month. And then the third Sunday of every month, what we do is we have people come up with their birthdays and their anniversaries. And so if you celebrate a birthday this month or you're having an anniversary, and we have them get up and you know uh, if that we get the women to confess how old they are, <laughs> uh, we uh, and we have people say how long they've been married and and that kind of thing. And and what that what those little touches do is they take the service and they say this service is about life. Mm-hmm. You know, this isn't you aren't just coming here to hear a collection of ideas or or be taught theology in the Bible detached from life. It's very much connected to life and it strikes me that this is a a, another possibility for that kind of time that can mm-hmm. be very nicely integrated into a, a regular rotation of the service uh, to make a point. You know, another idea that strikes me is that we often have uh, personal testimonies about how people are engaged in this or that kind of ministry in the church as a way of encouraging people to participate. Well, what prevents you from taking that time and making it be about pe- how people have have seen the integration of their faith at their work and make that the focus of the conversation. Absolutely. Uh, One other example, uh, I've talked to a pastor who has incorporated this into new member intake. So when, when people become members of their church, uh, the, uh, the, the pastors and elders say to them, uh, we want you to see this church as equipping you and partnering with you in mm. your work. Uh, and so it's actually on the member intake form asking people what they do. Uh, what their work is, and then and then just to it's a it's a framing moment when you become a member of their church. Uh, they say we want you to view us as partners mm-hmm. with you, equipping you for your vocations. Uh, now, I know and, I know the know. church in New York in Manhattan Apostles Church in, in Manhattan, which uh, which has formed, and I know Redeemer's uh, Church, uh, Tim Keller's church in New York does this as well. What they have done is they have formed uh, some of their small group work around people who share the same job so mm-hmm. that when they come together they're only praying for family needs and, and and ministry concerns of the church but they're able to share their common challenge in the workplace mm-hmm. as part of their small group structure and I, that's an interesting way uh, to and go know, about it um, faith and work small groups are actually much more widespread than many people are aware. Mm-hmm. Uh, and part of the problem is a very – this is not the case in, in those churches you mentioned, mm-hmm. but very often those faith and work small groups have been formed as sort of on their own mm-hmm. by, the, by the laity or by someone whose job is to, to cultivate that, and it's disconnected from the rest of the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one thing that I think is commendable about uh, the, the churches you mentioned and mm-hmm. some other churches that are doing this is that they are seeking to make that intentional, uh, uh, to integrate that with the whole life of the church so that it's not the lay people have their thing right. Right, that's over in a corner and has nothing to do with what we do on Sunday morning. Right. right? But uh, so the churches you've mentioned uh, have actually uh, intentionally connected Sunday worship to these, these uh, faith and work small groups where people can talk about their work more specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a barrier 
the pastors will often say, well, I don't, I, I don't know the ins and outs of every profession. Mm-hmm. So I can't speak specifically to, you know, the plumbers and the doctors and the factory line workers and the landscapers and the stay-at-home moms and the this and the that and the that. Well, you can't get into the details of all those professions. It's not the pastor's job to kind of understand the ins and mm-hmm. outs of every profession. Mm-hmm. Um, but the pastor does need to help people interpret the meaning of their lives. Mm-hmm. And that means in, interpreting the meaning of our work. Mm-hmm. And then the people who know that profession can kind of pick up the ball from there and say, okay, we who know you know, whatever their, our profession is, how do we then make this, apply this more tangibly? In the yeah, I, I think that the, this is a this is an issue of mindset. This is why I like what the current Family Foundation is doing because they're helping pastors think through their mindset in these areas. And what I mean by that is, is yeah, I can't replicate what goes on in every job, but a good pastor is meeting with people regularly, having lunches with their leaders, that kind of thing. They can they can come if they ask if they have mm-hmm. the mindset. They can come to understand and try and develop an understanding of what it is that the people in their in their churches are going through what they're living through we'll do it with a sickness mm-hmm. you know we'll mm-hmm. do it with a with a family issue but uh, so why can't we do it in the area of work that's just a mindset problem yeah. in my mind go have lunch with people in their workplaces yeah that i often see light bulbs going off over pe- pastors heads when they you know we go into homes mm-hmm. to have lunch or to have dinner with people in their homes we visit people in their homes we go visit the sick in the hospital why don't why don't we go have lunch with people in their workplaces? You you'll be surprised how much you can pick up just from mm-hmm. a visit like that. That's right. And, and asking certain questions yeah. of people while you're having lunch about their lives, where they're living, and then that that actually can help the pastor met, cross the bridge because mm-hmm. what you get is the experience of life that can come into il- through illustrations and through examples and that kind of thing, which allows a pastor to salt and pepper their messages with, with where people really are. So I, I, my, my own sense is, is, that, is that this is, you know, we, we, train pastors, we train pastors at seminaries to do a whole lot of things and to think about a whole lot of areas. But if you don't have the category, you're not going to go there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so developing the sense in, of having the category and going there and thinking about going there uh, and in doing it with some intentionality, uh, that's mm-hmm. how you kind of get over the hump. Yeah. So hopefully the after uh, has these kinds of elements in it, sermons where we're talking about what goes on from nine to five, people who think about uh, – there, there's a subtle thing, there's another subtle thing I want to be sure we highlight in what's being said here. It's not just going to work to think about how can I minister the gospel to the person that I'm sitting next to, which is mm-hmm. how most people think about being a Christian at their work is yeah. all about. Yeah. It's about how I do my work Christian. Yeah, and I think the two uh, the two things that we tend to fall into one is uh, evangelism narrowly understood, and the other is ethics narrowly understood. So you know, yeah, don't steal from your from your workplace, that kind of thing. Well, okay, yes, don't steal from your <laughs> yes, that's essential, right? Okay. Yeah, ethical integrity is important, and sharing the gospel with people when opportunity arises is important. Um, but understanding the work itself mm-hmm. as an activity that we're made for and an activity that we are being restored for uh, in our redemption uh, is is much deeper than that and will also provide the context in which you know, ethical behavior and, pre, you know, sort of sharing the gospel with people becomes much easier and much more successful. Well, this has been a good introduction, I think, into uh, holistic discipleship. This document, Theology uh, That Works, is an, is an important introduction into this area. If someone wanted – is it possible for someone to get a hold of, the, of this piece from the foundation? Yeah, we have uh, – uh, our seminary network is called the Oikonomia Network, mm-hmm. um, and that's a the Greek word that means both stewardship and economics, mm-hmm. um, and it reflects our desire to bring uh, the idea of good stewardship back into our workplaces where the economy happens. Uh, in, the, uh, in the New Testament, this word is used in both, both to refer to church stewardship and to refer to our, our activity uh, in, in the workplace. Um, so the, the website is called uh, oikonomianetwork.org, mm-hmm. and at that website, the, uh, the paper Theology That Works is there, and we have a number of other resources uh, that, uh, that people can check out.
Well, that's great. Well, what we're planning on doing beyond this one uh, podcast is to actually systematically work through the sections of this document and kind of flesh out what what is being expressed there, both conceptually as well as practically ask, all right, what does this actually look like, or what might this look like, um, to, to stimulate people's thinking in this regard. So Greg, I really appreciate your coming in to be a part of this today and to to launch this initiative with us. We are uh, thrilled about it and are looking forward to uh, many more uh, visits with one another. Uh, you probably won't always be here in Dallas. We'll probably have to do a little bit of Skype work uh, uh, since you're well, up there a, in Wisconsin. There's a section, section of the paper on technology. We can talk about there that you go. as applied. <laughs> That's right. Well, we're looking forward to, to more interactions. We're certainly looking forward to the conference uh, coming up, and uh, we just appreciate you taking the time to be with us in introducing us to this topic. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And we thank you for being a part of the table where we discuss issues of the relationship between God and culture. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.